this video is going to cover the various descriptive research methods. By the time we finish the video, you should be able to define various research terminology, recognize several forms of descriptive research, identify the advantages and disadvantages of these descriptive research designs, and describe the correlational method and identify its limitation. The scientific method is the process used by scientists to conduct research. It involves gathering empirical evidence or data, using systematic observations and experimentation. This video is going to cover those methods that gather data using systematic observations which are the descriptive research methods. Descriptive research is mainly concerned with describing the phenomenon that the investigator is interested in studying. It allows a researcher to develop hypotheses or predictions about the causes of behavior, but descriptive research cannot reveal cause-effect relationships. So you can make predictions about what these cause-effect relationships may be, but it does not actually allow you to say that one variable causes a change in another. The only research method that can actually reveal cause-effect relationships is the experimental research design, and we're not going to discuss that one in this video because it is not descriptive. So the first descriptive research method that I'm going to discuss is the case study. It is a detailed investigation of usually one individual, such as the Phineas Gage case, or it can be a small group of individuals. Case study is used when the phenomenon that's being studied is unique or rare, there may only be one individual with that particular set of circumstances, or there may be only a very small group of individuals that are that have that characteristic that the researcher is interested in. There may not be 200 or 1,000 individuals. In those cases where you have a unique or a rare phenomenon, you would use a case study method to investigate that particular phenomenon. The advantage of a case study is that you are able to gain a tremendous amount of detailed information about that individual. The disadvantage is that that information that you gain may not actually generalize or apply to anyone other than that one individual or that small group of individuals, so it may not be generalizable. The case study method also cannot provide definitive support for a hypothesis. You have only a sample of one in the case of an individual that you're studying, and you have no basis for comparison. Therefore, you only have information that is an N of one in research terminology, or uh, your number of individuals being studied is just one. The case study research design is also subject to observer bias. Observer bias is when the researcher makes errors in recording their observations that result from the researcher's attitudes influencing the way that they see the data. Their expectations may influence the data that they collect. Their value system may influence the way that they see the data. For example, a researcher who may be from a different culture than the individual that they are investigating may 
misinterpret that individual's behaviors or motivations because the researcher is not familiar with all of the nuances of that particular person's culture. There are other ways that observer bias can influence the way that a researcher actually records data, but we aren't going to go into all of those. Let's serve it to say that observer bias involves a researcher seeing what they expect to see, and those expectations are influenced by something about that researcher, either their attitudes, their expectations, their value systems. The next descriptive research design that we're going to discuss is naturalistic observation. Naturalistic observation involves watching animals or people in their natural environments. The advantage of naturalistic observation is that you get a realistic view of that individual, those persons, those animals, because they are in their natural environment, they're doing what they do naturally. And ideally, they're not aware that they're being observed. The disadvantage is that you have absolutely no control over that situation. You have no control over who comes into that environment. You have no control over any of the items or elements that are present in that environment. For example, if you are watching children playing in a park, a city park, you can't determine how many children are there. You can't determine what items are there for the children to play with. And if you're watching sharing behavior, there may not be enough items for you to get a really full picture of those children's sharing behavior because there aren't that many toys to share. So you have no control and that's a big disadvantage in a naturalistic observation. Observer bias also may come in, as it can with just about any of these uh, descriptive research designs. The, another disadvantage of the naturalistic observation is that you are in a unique setting, and observations that you make in that particular setting may not hold true in another similar setting. You may observe children playing in Martin Luther King Jr. Park, and you may observe another group of children playing in at Sydney Park, downtown Columbia. And what you observe in one of those settings, because it's unique, because they're all different, may be different. And observations that you make, conclusions that you draw, may not be true in another setting simply because it's another setting with a different group of children and you don't have in any control to be able to make those natural settings more similar. Laboratory observation involves watching animals or people in an artificial but controlled situation and that is the advantage that you have complete control over that environment. If you were doing a laboratory observation in a park setting, it would be a park in which you make the decisions about what toys are going to be available, what whether there's going to be a swing set, whether there will be five swings or two, whether there's going to be a slide, if there are going to be balls and how many balls. So the advantage is you make decisions. You have complete control over what happens in that setting in terms of what is available for the children to play with. The disadvantage is that because you make decisions about what's in that setting, the, the setting becomes artificial. And an artificial setting may yield artificial behavior. The more you control what is there, how many children are there, how long they get to stay and play you remove that naturalness of their behavior to a certain extent. And that's a disadvantage of a laboratory observation. The survey 
research method involves researchers who are using interviews or questionnaires to gather information about the behaviors, the beliefs, the attitudes, the experiences of a group of people. Those researchers ask standardized questions of large groups of people and those people that they are providing those questions to represent a sample of the population that the researcher is interested in. The advantage of the survey method is the ability to get a large amount of data in a short period of time. Surveys don't take that long. Even interviews, you can interview large groups of people in a relatively short period of time. You also have the advantage that depending on your survey methodology, whether it's a paper and pencil questionnaire or a questionnaire over a computer or an interview, you have the ability to ask them about sensitive topics. Surveys, questionnaires are usually anonymous and people are more willing to talk about or discuss or provide information about sensitive topics when they believe that you will not know whose answers those are. There are several disadvantages to the survey method. One is that the potential respondents have to be carefully selected. You need a representative sample. And sometimes it can be difficult to get a representative sample. I'll talk about exactly what that is uh, a little later. Your respondents, the people who are responding to your interview or your questionnaire, also may not always tell the truth. Sometimes participants lie, and they lie for different reasons. Sometimes they don't tell the truth because of what researchers call a courtesy bias. They want to give you the answer that they think you want. They want to be helpful. They want to give you answers that they think is going to help your research. It's a courtesy bias when you really want a truthful answer. There's also a phenomenon called social desirability. And this is when the respondent, the participant in the survey, tries to fake good. They want to look better or they want to impress you that they are different than they really are. For instance, if you ask them if one of the questions involves how many sex partners they've had within the past year, and that respondent may actually have had 30 sex partners but they don't want you to think that they're promiscuous. They don't want you to get a negative view of them. So they respond in a socially desirable manner and say they've had two sex partners versus the 30 that they've had. That gives you inaccurate data. And sometimes people don't tell the truth because they simply don't remember the answer. And they give you an estimate or they give you their best guess. Once again, that introduces error into your data. Another disadvantage of the survey method is that it can be costly and time consuming. Questionnaires are usually relatively quick and easy. If you're doing an interview method, with your survey, it's going to take much more time. It takes more people because you are trying to gather information from a few hundred people and surveys using an interview format are just going to take longer. Finally, the survey method skims the surface of a person's beliefs and attitudes they may tell you what their beliefs are or what their attitude is about a particular issue, but it does not tell you why they believe that way. So you don't get the depth that you 
may potentially want. I said that I was going to go over some of that terminology that I just used when talking about surveys. A population is the entire group of interest to the researchers, and it is the group to which the researcher wants to generalize their findings. This, the population, is the group from which a sample is selected. A sample is a part of the population that's studied, and you use that sample to reach conclusions about the entire population. So, if I wanted to gain information about students in the Columbia, South Carolina area, I would not try to gather information from every student in the Columbia, South Carolina area. That would be too many individuals, it would be too costly, it would be too time consuming. So I would take a sample of that population, which means that I want only some of those students, but there are many students and let's narrow that a little more and say college students. There are many college students in the Columbia, South Carolina area because there are many colleges and universities. There is Midlands Tech. There is the University of South Carolina. There is Benedict College. There is Allen University. And there are other, there's South University. There are many colleges, universities within this area and I would need to sample individuals from all of those in order to get a representative sample. And this is what you really want. A representative sample is a sample that mirrors the population of interest. It includes basically all of the important subgroups in the same, in the same proportions as they're found in the population. This is why it can be difficult to get a representative sample. Not that you couldn't find these individuals, but once you find them or contact them, they don't always want to be in your research. They may not respond. So it can be difficult to get a representative sample. But what you want is a representative sample so that it truly represents the population and gives you more accurate information. The correlational method is the last descriptive research method that I'm going to discuss. The correlation is a statistical technique that allows researchers to discover and predict relationships between variables that that researcher is interested in examining. The correlation coefficient is the actual statistical measure. It's symbolized by this little italicized R, and here it's just a plain R. And that correlation coefficient indicates the strength and the direction of the relationship between two variables. A variable is simply what you're interested in studying. You, you can call it a variable, you can call it a factor, it's that thing that you're studying. Advantages of the correlational method include the fact that it can be very useful for making predictions about what you expect to find and about what those relationships will be. It can be useful in situations when variables cannot be manipulated because of ethical considerations. And what I'm talking about here, manipulating variables, involves an experimental research design. So ideally, you might want to do an experiment, but you may not be able to do an experimental research design because it might be unethical to do so. Uh, given that some experiments might involve harm to the individual. So instead of doing an experiment, you look at what is naturally there and look at the relationship between the variables that you're interested in. For example, a high-fat diet 
and heart disease. Well, you could not ethically do an experiment where you set up two groups and feed one of them a high fat diet because your hypothesis is that a high fat diet contributes to the development of heart, cardiovascular disease or heart attacks. So you couldn't do that. But what you can do is look at what people are already eating and divide those individuals into people who eat a high fat diet and people who eat a low fat diet, follow them over time and look at the relationship between their diet and how many of them have heart attacks at some point down the road. Another advantage of this correlational method is that it can be done fairly quickly. You look at the data and you do the statistical manipulation and determine whether there is a relationship and the type of the relationship as well as the strength of the relationship, the direction and the strength of that relationship. The disadvantage is that just because there is a correlation between two variables, it does not prove or mean that there is a cause-effect relationship existing between those two variables. And ideally, that is what you want. You really want to determine if eating a high-fat diet causes individuals to experience cardiovascular disease or heart attacks. And you can't do that with a correlational method. The only research method that allows you to talk about cause-effect relationships is the experimental research design, which is not a descriptive research method. So you have two types of correlations. You have positive correlations and you have negative correlations. A positive correlation, in a positive correlation, variables are related in the same direction, which means that when they change, they change in the same direction. Positive correlations exist when increases in one variable are matched by increases in the other variable, or decreases in one variable are matched by decreases in the other variable. However, they vary, they vary in the same direction. They either go up together or they go down together. For example, if we look at the correlation or the relationship between food intake and weight gain, how much you eat and how much weight you gain, one correlation, one relationship is the more you eat, the more weight you gain. This is a positive correlation because as one variable goes up, the other also goes up. They both go in the same direction. That's a positive correlation. You could also say the less you eat, the less weight you gain, in which case they would both go down. So with a positive correlation, the variables are related in the same direction. With a negative correlation, the variables are related in opposite directions. Negative correlations exist when increases in one variable are matched by decreases in the other variable. For example, looking at the relationship between gas prices and how much you drive, driving mileage. Usually, as gas prices increase, the amount that you drive, the number of miles that you drive, decrease, particularly when gas prices skyrocket. People try to drive less so that they use less gas and have to pay less money at the pumps. As one goes up, the other goes down. That is a negative correlation. Okay, those are the descriptive research methods that I'm going to discuss. So try this to see if you understand correlations. What is a possible correlation between smoking and health status?
you might say, the more a person smokes, the less healthy that person is. If you said that, is it a positive or a negative correlation? What is the relationship between those two variables? If you said it's a negative correlation, then you are correct. The more you smoke, the more smoking goes up, the less healthy that person is. Health status will decline. They vary in the opposite direction, so that is a negative correlation. Excellent.